beautiful uh, naked man and woman uh, making uh, love, uh, hot monkey love. What does F U mean? I didn't quite get that. My name yes. is Gabe Friedman. Although I'm not the most well-known Trauma alumni, from Terra Firmer to Citizen Toxie, Toxic Avenger Part 4 to Poultry Geist, Night of the Chicken Dead to Hashtag Shakespeare Shitstorm, I've been involved with Lloyd and the Trauma team for many moons and many movies. I joined the Trauma team right after graduating from college and I had the fortune of both co-writing or co-editing multiple Trauma movies, documentaries, countless trailers, and other Michigas. But um, prior to my career in Tromaville, uh, and before I was a know-it-all NYU student, I was a trauma fan. I still remember watching The Toxic Avenger for the first time and being blown away by this mad magazine comes to life, meets Grand Guignol Gorfes. It was like someone asked, what can't you do in a movie? <coughs> and when they got the rules, they said, F you, I'm doing that. And that someone I later learned was Lloyd Kaufman. I was hooked. And so are legions of other future cinematic legends. Lloyd and the Troma team are directly and sometimes indirectly responsible for starting so many careers, including mine. So when Lloyd blackmailed me, uh, asked me to chat with him for this AFM event, it got me thinking. While film school was an invaluable experience, and I mean that, the tuition is ridiculous. I ended up learning so much more during my time in Tromaville. And as any member of the Troma team can attest, Anyone who can make it through a trauma production can handle whatever they encounter in the future. It's a real do I do or DIY process. Tromaville is a film school for those who cannot afford film school. And you kind of get paid in the process as well. Additionally, with Lloyd being involved in the film industry for over 50 years, he may have picked up some good learnings and perhaps he'd be willing to share them with the online crowd today. And since big movies are currently not being made or not being made well, there are opportunities for the little guy to shine once again. Young artists who feel like it was hopeless can be energized and educated to make these movies. And this year is going to be really interesting. There's new potential for talent to step up and be seen. So today, we're going to talk through a hypothetical trauma film from conception to completion and ask Lloyd what advice he can share from his 50 years in filmmaking. Now, this is just a primer, a 60-minute introduction to the patented trauma system of how to make your own damn movie. So if you want to learn more, please, please, please check out the various making of documentaries and the Make Your Own Damn Movie books Lloyd and Tromba have produced over the years. They're terrific. So without further ado, the oldest living teenager, Lloyd Kaufman. Lloyd, how are you? Well, uh, thank you for that uh, delightful introduction, Gabe Friedman. Uh, I believe it's now going to be 40 minutes. Uh, make your own damn movie in 40 minutes. But, uh, well, you know, I think that's for the best. But you can, uh, uh, you folks out there in the dark, uh, uh, you can always ask me questions after the, uh, we'll be in the uh, the bar section of this uh, virtual uh, meeting. And uh, I'm on uh, at Lloyd Kaufman on Twitter. I answer my own uh, questions and uh, on Twitter. All in haiku format, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, usually, yeah, yeah. Yeah. By the way, what, okay. is, what does F-U mean? I didn't quite get that. Uh, no, no, just joking. That, that's uh, <laughs> the university I went to before NYU. I know. the first, uh, uh, So, Lloyd, let's get into it. Writing. Uh, what is the must-do in every script? Well, uh, the most important thing is to uh, have something to say. Uh, I find, I'm in about 400 movies uh, most of them are fledgling uh, directors or, or first-time filmmakers. And um, I find that many of them don't have much to say. And they think it's just a, uh, a party that all we do at Troma is take drugs and uh, get drunk. Uh, we don't allow that on the set. The point is have, a, have something to say. Make it entertaining. Make your script entertaining. Um, uh, uh, and uh, try to... Uh, Make sure that uh, you have, uh, in my case, I like uh, political or satirical, uh, I want to take part in the actions and passions of my time, yet uh, make something like uh, the Toxic Avenger, which was about uh, the environment long before Al Gore uh, invented the uh, internet. <laughs> Finally reached puberty. Uh, 
Uh, I like to have a, something that will be uh, timely, but yet uh, deal, uh, you know, with something bigger than life itself, but personal and intimate enough to touch each and every one of us, like uh, Tromeo and Juliet, uh, uh, one of my Shakespeare efforts, uh, made by one of our protégés, James Gunn. By the way, I had a cameo in uh, Ca uh, Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, hundreds of thousands of tickets have been sold because of my incredible cameo. But more important, there were about 3,000 people on the set that day, and James Gunn made a speech that even he worked at Troma for a number of years, and even though he's making $200 million movies, uh, he's channeling Lloyd Kaufman because he wants to be a responsible director, abide by the budget, abide by the safety, all the rules of Troma. Speaking of Gunn, let me interrupt you before. Uh, you, you talk about working with, with a collaborator like you and I have, have written before, but we are remarkably slow. Uh, so talk to me about how do I find a collaborator who can get my ideas out there? Well, Troma is a great, um, how shall I say it, a tributary uh, to the ocean of talent. Uh, we uh, find people who are just uh, beginning and who are brilliant. For example, uh, you and I and uh, some guy named Shakespeare came up with a storyline for hashtag Shakespeare shitstorm, uh, which has been rep uh, just uh, finished. And uh, uh, I believe our uh, crack squad are uh, talking to people at the AFM at this very moment. Uh, we, uh, we came up with that story, but uh, we're very slow writers and procrastinate and drink and uh, take a pot and all that. So uh, it's, we found a very talented young man, Brandon Basham, Brandon Basham had made a couple of films prior to meeting us. They're terrific, made them for nothing. And uh, we're, we've been putting them on, uh, sh on uh, Troma Now, and they're doing great. They're doing amazingly well on our streaming service. And they're fun. He's a big Troma fan, so the movies are funny. They have some political satire or social satire, more, more social satire. And they got guns and weapons and horror. And, uh, you know, they're like, like Troma, a Cuisinart of the... Uh, of, of the different genres. What? Whoa, 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 whoa. Are you, excuse me? No, uh, sorry, sir. Uh, I am not a member of the LGBT community, first of all, so you're inaccurate. Second of all. So we have a script, uh, but movies can't be made without money. And you've made a lot of movies, uh, some for a lot of money, some for a little bit of money. So. How do we uh, get suckers, I, I mean investors, uh, to, to give you money? Uh, do you create a business proposal? Where do you find these people? I've heard dentists. Well, we've uh, been around since 1974, when if you made a, a half a million dollar movie, uh, the worst that would happen is you'd break even after a couple of years. Worst case. Uh, now, unfortunately, uh, due to the consolidation of the media and the industry being uh, much more in the hands of uh, the big guys, uh, we uh, the five hundred thousand dollar budget doesn't work, but uh, that's still the movie I make. So hashtag Shakespeare shitstorm uh, was basically uh, when my wife wasn't looking. I wrote some checks from the back of her checkbook, and she still doesn't know that uh, about eighty percent of the budget came uh, for hashtag Shakespeare shitstorm came from uh, our mutual checkbook. And then we've got a few uh, patrons of the art who give us the rest and knowing that they're gonna lose money. On the other hand, I'm producing some movies for very little money uh, by, other young, by other directors who are young and uh, know the digital world a lot better. And they multitask now. They write their own music. They do their own CGI in many cases. <laughs> in fact, we have a <clears throat> movie we just finished, Mutant Blast. It's terrific. It looks as good as any of our trauma movies. Uh, that's not saying much, of course, but uh, yes. it's good enough for our fans. Uh, what was I saying? Whatever it was, it was fascinating. Great. It was really, it was fascinating. And I think you hit on a lot, but we can also, I want to keep it moving because we have been known to veer off course. So, okay, we've got investors. We have a decent first draft. Now, you're juggling different tasks. What? what let's talk about pre-production. What, what's that all about? Well, the macro uh, note is uh, that uh, spend a lot of time preparing. Uh, we make $500,000 movies that look like $50 million. And, and you can see it with hashtag Shakespeare shitstorm. It looks as good as any uh, major movie, or maybe better. 
so have a long pre-production period. We do a lot of rehearsals because usually we cannot afford, since we have thousands of people in our movies, we cannot afford to abide by the Screen Actors Guild. So we, um, we use new talent, new young talent for the most part. I am Trent, I'm reading for Jerry. He's gone now. The artist who never compromised who understood what it means to push buttons and never back away, no matter how many... The artist who never compromised understood what it, mean, what it, what it means to push buttons and never back away. Ready for the role of Jerry? I'll take the Larry Cohens, John Stales, and these fucked up trauma guys any day. And uh, we'd like to shoot on real locations. Uh, John G. Avelson, uh, uh, director of award-winning, Oscar-winning uh, Rocky and uh, Karate Kid and... Cry Uncle, uh, which is on the Troma streaming service, Troma Now. Uh, he loved location, real locations. He also liked shooting with unknowns. Uh, and I have kept that going, except my budgets are much smaller than his were, except for Cry Uncle, of course, which you should see. It's hilarious. And it was made in uh, 1970 for about 150000 maximum. Hi, kid. I hear you're terrific light. Yes, it runs in the family. Yeah. <laughs> any rate, uh, the point is, uh, rehearse, rehearse, uh, eyeball every prop. Don't wait for your prop person to show up with it. Eyeball everything. Approve every costume. Make sure everything fits. Let's uh, let's move on, shall we? Um, you you brought up you brought up location scouting. I kind of want to bring it back a little bit sure. to that because I think sure, that's important. Uh, in addition to directing crazy scenes in real life locations, one of your first jobs, as you mentioned, in the industry was location scouting for movies like Rocky and Saturday Night Fever. And Lloyd also has some great cameos in both those movies. That's reason enough to watch those movies. So when it comes to location scouting, what are the must dos? I think you should sort of, again, I, all the movies I've done, including uh, Rocky and Saturday Night Fever, they were basically studio movies, but m made for a million bucks, low budget. And the reason they had me produce the Philadelphia part of it is because I'm a one-man band. I could do everything. And Michael Hurst synced up the dailies and shipped them back and forth, 35 millimeter. So, um, uh, and we had some trauma people who uh, we, we gave to the cause. So um, we were able to... Uh, <laughs> it's like running for Congress. You have to get the people on the location to invest their uh, their emotion in your career. You have to tell the truth to the people who own the locations. For example, if you're going to be making a, a movie with a beautiful uh, naked man and woman uh, making uh, love, uh, hot monkey love, if that the family that whose house you're using uh, has little children, you better tell them up front what's going on. The point is they can kick you out. A location contract is like toilet paper. It means nothing. And if you lose a day of filming because someone kicks you out or you lose you lose your permit, as we did when we had a naked man, a uh, naked fat man with a small penis running across uh, Times Square without uh, the proper permit. So you have to be very, very honest, and you always have a plan B. I don't know There's why it's so smart. They, they tell me at the last minute that... You know, rather than tell me at the beginning of the day, they tell me, at the late, you know, like like now, that we have to be off by 8 o'clock. Well, listen, you guys have to tell me at the beginning of the day. you got to be out by 8 o'clock, right? This Nobody told me. It was a daytime shot, Lloyd. It was marked well, So what? you got to tell me that. I don't, I'm assuming I can shoot all day. You guys have to say, boys, your day ends at 8 o'clock. Like it or not. I would have been out of here. I wouldn't, you know, I could have quit other stuff, you know. I mean, I think we could. I'm going to go look at dailies. It's very important. Have a, have a backup location for every place you're going to uh, uh, use uh, uh, you know for one weather you want to have a cover set but more important if you get kicked out or the guy doesn't show up make sure you have the key make sure you have the home number of the man with the key to open the store or or whatever it is uh, don't be shy about that and have a second, right have a, a second location that you can go to uh, uh, let's talk about the three rules of production. You know, safety to human. That's the rule number one. Safety to people's property and make a good movie, much smaller type. We make beautiful posters. We put them all over the the pre-production office, in the bathrooms, on the dog or whatever. Uh, and when we get to the set, they go on the trucks, on the craft service table. Uh, we want to brainwash our young uh, actors and crew that it is only a movie, and it's very dangerous to make a movie. Get yeah, your view on how that stunt went. Uh, the three rules of 
production, Troma rules of production. We're not posted. They, I don't, they're not posted here because we moved back to this location. And um, I think that is the primary reason why this stunt, while it looked very good on camera, came very close to uh, killing people. I'm not happy. I don't think it's worthwhile. I don't think the shot really was worth it. And it wasn't really that good. So. Let's move on. Let's move on. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, okay. While you're looking for the cat, uh, while you're looking for your location, mm -hmm. while you're while you're finding your world, you're also casting your movie. So let's let's talk about uh, trauma actors have to perform some pretty crazy things in their movies. Um, what are the secrets to finding those right and loyal actors? Tell me about that. Well, uh, now trauma entertainment is famous uh, for producing uh, stars of tomorrow: Trey Parker, Matt Stone, Vincent D'Onofrio. Samuel L. Jackson, James Gunn, Eli Roth, Gabe Friedman. We're famous for discovering and, and launching people's careers, both behind the camera and in front of it. So uh, we, uh, we get a line around the block when we announce that we're, ca uh -oh, that we're casting. Uh, sorry, these damn union people with the lighting, they don't, uh, you know, they're working off the books, but, uh, you know, it's all right. It's, you know, that's the thing, safety to humans. Uh, so you talk a little bit about... Uh about casting i do want to talk about well the casting a lot is of very what? important uh, you've got to have a nucleus of casting crew that uh you have to uh cut out the cancer on the presidency if there's anybody so you got to uh, your leads especially on return to newcomb high and the second movie return to return to newcomb high volume two uh which we shot before hashtag shakespeare shitstorm uh, uh the lead uh actor there, there were two uh, cis female actors who had the leads. Uh, one of them just uh, we were doing the Museum of Modern Art uh, showing. She told she told the audience that she came back twelve times to audition, and she had to audition naked. So uh, you know, once they do that, you have a pretty good idea that they a want the part, and b uh, the nudity probably is going to be okay. Although you can still have problems. Uh, when we made Terror Firmer, Tra Trent Hager would have given his right nut to be in, uh, to have a big part in Terra Firma. He was not in the movie business at the time and he loved uh, Troma. And uh, he, he, I saw that he would be uh, loyal and uh, creative and, uh, you know, be part of the team for sure, be more than part of the team, even though there might have been, he had not acted in a movie that I know of. And um, uh, he uh, 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 was, uh, maybe there were people who were better in the, had more craft and actor studio and that kind of stuff. But I, I chose Trent Hager because I knew he was a, a capable actor as well as 100% uh, behind the crazy script. And has and uh, Terra Firma is, uh, I, I still can't believe, when I see that movie uh, 30 years later, I can't believe we made it. I can't believe the actors did it. I can't believe the whole crew did it. It's terrific. And Gabe Friedman? Edited. No! This is a trauma movie! No! Maybe we talk a little bit more about you, you audition. I don't know if we want to talk about now. You audition people uh, 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 naked a lot of the time. You rehearse them naked because you had a, a, a previous uh, mistake. You, yeah. you learn from your mistakes. Well, certainly. Like, I'm just gonna, we're, well, uh, this, this, squeeze play, right? Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, now it's your nose. I'm sorry. Uh, you can't imagine when you're 75 years old. And he took a lot of acid in the 60s. It's uh, terrible. You're freaking out, man. Back in the squeeze play days, uh, 1976, we had an actress who auditioned naked. And, uh, um, but uh, we got to the, uh, we started shooting the film and she was established. And I like to shoot in order, by the way. We'll come to that later on at this time. Uh, and she uh, comes to me crying uh, after the first week, I think. And we're, we're, it's a day off. 
and uh, uh, you know, trying to watch some porn. I mean, I was trying to uh, uh, you know plan the shots, and uh, she starts crying and uh, has to meet with me. And my mother, I, my mother saw me doing the naked scene. Blah 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 blah. blah. So uh, uh, as a result, uh, uh, or the, her scenes, uh, the nudity, I stupidly, rather than rewrite, I stupidly kept her in the movie, which I, in the past, I haven't done that. I've gotten rid of people who are uh, recalcitrant or egos or, you know, it, 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 like Toxic Avenger Part Two. I, uh, I, I, I fired the toxy guy. He was an idiot, uh, except he forgot that he was just a, a, a guy in a mask. But the uh, woman, uh, you'll see there's a shower scene in Squeeze Play where all the uh, cis women are wearing uh, bathing suits. You mentioned like the rehearsal process is so long on a trauma yeah. movie. And I think that that's one advantage that the trauma team and, and, all, and all indies have over Hollywood. Well, it's, uh, it's, can you it's, talk it's a little the union. About that's a good point. Uh, I like to shoot in sequence because then you can rewrite. You can, uh, uh, if you see somebody who's, a background we call everybody actor persons. Doesn't matter whether they're uh, what you would call the extra or they're the uh, the star of the movie. Uh, Vincent D'Onofrio was an actor person in the first Turn On, which is probably our funniest movie. And um, uh, and every time he was doing something in the background, he was hilarious. And eventually, we just kept uh, upgrading his uh, performances, and he eventually got a uh, part. Uh, he eventually had a featured role in the first turn on. I think his, we named him Lobotomy, and uh, he was he was very, very funny. Lobotomy, what are you doing back so soon from the nature hunt? Danny Anderson, Mitch, Annie, and Henry, funny cigarettes, frogs. What are you trying to tell me? Well, they're lost, and they're not coming back. 24 minutes, and we're, we haven't even gotten into production. So uh, let's talk about hiring a crew. Uh, how do you convince people to work for a low-budget movie? Well, for one, uh, most of the people who work for us now are fans. But uh, in the old days, uh, it was an opportunity for the person who had never been a director of photography, which was true on way back on... Uh, actually, at the beginning, I was my own director of photography, and I shot all the handheld stuff, and I kept doing that until we went to digital photography. But the guy who shot uh, Tromeo and Juliet, uh, the first movie where I did not have a lot of control over the uh, lighting and stuff, which is why that movie looks a lot better, uh, he wanted to move up the, uh, he had not shot a feature. So here's an opportunity for him to shoot a, a narrative feature uh, for a company that was at that time, uh, uh, well, uh, 74 to about 20 years old. And uh, it was a good opportunity for them. And for the younger people, it's like film school, as you mentioned, Gabe Friedman. So we have a lot of people that are going to work for us for free. Uh, that's that's uh, an advantage of trauma. Well, not really for free. What? Well, well, well hold yeah. on. Well, let's I do. Well, let's keep going. Uh, I I do want to know what do you have to spend money on in terms of crew? Like what are the what? I wasn't going to say Paramount. <laughs> who are the, who are <laughs> Who are the, what do you actually have to spend money on? Even Lloyd Cox. Well, certainly money. locations. You got to spend some money. And if you need something. Well, crew members. Oh, crew. Uh, well, you've got to have a good director of photography. I mean, the, the, your technical yeah. crew, you're going to have to pay a, a big piece of your budget. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember. I think, I think uh, well, but it's, it's a, for me, it's a lot of money. But uh, you've got to get it right. And, um, you look at their reels and you and you get the recommendations on hashtag Shakespeare. No, on return to Newcomb High and return to return to Newcomb High. Charlotte Kaufman uh, was uh, one of the directors of photography. But for uh, more than half of it, we had a guy who Mark Neville Dean uh, recommended. Uh, he made uh, the, uh, the um, uh, what did he make for uh, Oh, crank. Yeah, he, he made the crank movie. And he movies. put me in crank two, and I asked him, "Who do you think is on your technical crew is ready to move up to a director of photography?" And he uh, he recommended a guy, and the guy did a, a pretty good job. But there was but uh, there was culture clash. He, the, he and his team were from California, and everyone who goes on our crew must watch Poultry in Motion. Truth is stranger than chicken, which is the 
the making of Poultry Guys, Night of the Chicken Dead. It's on uh, on the Troma now for free uh, if you go the first month. Watch.troma.com. You'll watch that. That's as good as a year of filmmaking. It's hilarious. It's sad. It's factual. It has fist fighting. It has people proposing to each other. Uh, you can't imagine what goes on behind the behind the scenes. It was uh, incredible and uh, fascinating and educational. I want to keep yeah. going. Let's talk about the shooting yeah. schedule. Uh, I think you mentioned this before, but um, <laughs> you shoot all your movies in chronological order, except for one thing. I want to hammer that home. What is that uh, one thing, and why? And where did you learn chronological? Yes, order I just don't know what chronological means. Uh, oh, oh, oh! Yeah, uh, I know well, what you mean now. Thank you. Uh, it. Uh, yeah, we try to we try to shoot the beginning at the beginning and the end at the end. Now, something interesting, <clears throat> I had a, a part in one of Trey Parker's movies, the South Park guy, and he and Matt Stone rather together, not Oliver Stone who also started with us. Uh, he uh, he want he shot the last the last scene first on his first day of production, and I was in that scene um, because that was going to set up the sequel, and also he had another di distributor. And he didn't want to have any fights, I think. And, and, and so that he figured since he's established the end of the movie, they're not going to make him change things as he goes along. Uh, also, Trey Parker is a genius. And I guess he knows, like um, the uh, Queen's Gambit, the champion chess player, he can look ahead uh, 100 uh, scenes to, uh, to the ending. I can't. I can't. And uh, also, my movies have too many uh, moving parts. So I want to shoot in sequence. And even John Avelson did it wherever he could. Now, you can't uh, go back and forth between locations. You can't have 80 people going back and forth between Connecticut and New York to stay in uh, sequence. So uh, with that in mind, you'd, you can still shoot uh, a lot in sequence. And, and, and your last scenes, uh, try to shoot them at the end. So you can change the script, get rid of uh, the cancers that might grow in your... Uh, nucleus, uh, uh, switching metaphors, and um, uh, make a better movie. Make your own damn, make your own damn movie great again. Oop, uh, I mean, uh, uh, come on, come on. Uh, let's keep going. Uh, so let's talk about let's talk about some set operations and some thoughts. Like you've got some some learnings that you've had, and for instance, have a writer and an editor on set. Talk to me about that. Well, if you, and again, I haven't, I've been in a number of big time movies and uh, was involved in a, producing a couple. Um, and uh, uh, which needless to say, uh, when I was uh, associate producer on the final countdown with Martin Sheen, Kirk Douglas, blah, blah, blah. Horrible. Uh, the movie's mediocre. It's still okay. It's not a bad movie, but it, it definitely was not art, an art. Uh, anyway, the, uh, if you can have the writer there and you can have the editor there, uh, A, I uh, don't use the C word very much, uh, continuity. And B, um, uh, gee, we're getting a lot of people uh, saying nice things here. <laughs> a lot of LMAOs. <laughs> I don't want to even know what that means. Um, I think that's a band. That's oh, a band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Come on, let's uh, get uh, So the point is uh, uh, the editor can keep an eye on the continuity. And again, we have very young people doing the script uh, uh, script person part. Uh, they very often don't uh, know. Uh, they very often miss continuity problems. Uh, and uh, and the writer, if you have the writer there, uh, like uh, Brandon Bassam, uh, who was not there very much because he teaches at the Upright Citizens Brigade and uh, uh, whatever, has kids, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but if you can have the writer there, boy, that's great. And the editor there. Uh, get them. They were there for rehearsals on the hashtag Shakespeare shitstorm, and that really does help. They come up with ideas and change the ideas. And if you're on the set filming the real movie, uh, the the comments are. In fact, if you see poultry in motion, you'll see Mr. Gabe Friedman coming up with a very intelligent comments, and Uncle Lloyd uh, behaving like an absolute asshole uh, on the set. That's why that documentary is so good. There's no uh, varnish. It's the unvarnished truth. There's just not warts yes, and all. Uh, anal warts. Uh, I, let's let's keep going. I want to see how much more we can fit okay. in ten minutes. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of 
zip through it um, because my intro is only two well, hours long. Uh, uh, I, let's I, talk about. I've written well, seven books, all film related. To make your own damn movie set of books. Let's yeah. keep going. Uh, you do talk of something that's two very important things. I'm gonna I'm gonna put okay. them together because uh, we gotta we gotta keep okay. rock and rolling. Um, let's talk about how important craft services is and how important making friends with the Teamsters are. Well, it uh, when I was a production manager on the movies and on the final countdown, the uh, the basic uh, lunch and uh, having enough chairs and uh, the food on slow dancing in the big city, uh, the constant complaints about the food. Slow dancing in the big city was one of John G. Avelson's movies. It's terrific, but it uh, was not successful. But the crew on that one, until we gave them like slop, uh, they didn't like it. Um, and the same on final on uh, the final countdown. There was more about the food and and the uh, overtime and uh, catering or whatever. And the hotel, Jimmy Farantino didn't like his hotel room. It was smaller than Kirk Douglas. Horrible. So, um, but if you're making a micro budget movie or a trauma movie, uh, feed your crew. I learned that the hard way on. Troma's War, which is a great movie. Troma's War, uh, a kind of a cursed movie, but it just uh, was trending when it was on Joe Bob's The Drive-In Show. Uh, it's a great movie. It just was ahead of its time. At least you had enough sense to get to high ground. What are you looking at? Yeah, I didn't want to stand out in my cities, okay? One of those, Parker. Ears, what'd you think? Uh, Troma's War. I uh, I didn't feel we had to have hot meals all the time, even though the crew was living on location and we were living in a uh, army uh, camp in barracks. And um, uh, 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 so finally, the crew uh, had a strike, and uh, they refused to work unless they got a hot meal, which basically was Kentucky Fried Chicken. That's all they wanted. And I was like, oh, I'm not going to give into that. And I called Michael Hurst, my partner, uh, who never appears in public. And he basically told me that uh, he would kill me if uh, I didn't uh, give him their hot mail. On that subject, I do want to get it through before hmm. we run out of time. Um, real quick, let's talk about why you made friends with the team. Well, that was on a big time movie, uh, you know, union movie. And uh, compared to me, it was big time. For United Artists, it was not big. The Teamsters are very important. They, they uh, get your parking places. Teamsters are the truck drivers. And they get your, um, uh, you know, they, they can slow a production down. They can take a long time to wrap. They can, there are all sorts of things they can do, you know, moving cars. Uh, so uh, on Slow Dancing in the Big City, for example, I made buddies with the Teamster captain. I also made buddies with the Teamster captain and the number one driver on the final countdown. Uh, speaking of time, uh, something yes. that we've talked a lot about is paying attention to the clock. Uh, time is money. Yes. And let's talk about breaking down the call sheet and how much time you need in that 10 hour day and what, why time is the most valuable thing. Well, the trauma team uh, uh, has more like an 18 hour day. We do have a, we do uh, try to uh, have a 10 hour turnaround. So um, you don't want to start shooting uh, your movie at night unless you're going to be uh, all nights. It's midnight. No, from the beginning of the night. Yep. Oh, oh, oh. We have a lot to do. Yeah, I think it's time to start ripping pages out because this is kind of this is like an eight-hour movie. It's, every scene is taking twice as long as it should. So we shoot six days, but uh, they are very long days, and we try to have a ten-hour turnaround. And um, the crew usually is uh, much uh, nicer about it than a union crew would be. And they're in the crews on our movie for the past thirty years have been totally gung ho. So they. Uh, they're willing uh, to uh, to have a little bit less sleep, and and when you when you lodge people on the location, which we have done numerous times, um, even though they might be sleeping on the floor, all they have to do is roll out of their uh, water mattress and uh, stagger to the set, and they're up and running. They don't have to get up and take transportation or drive. So uh, it's very important, uh, I think, to uh, uh, give the drivers, of course, lots of uh, make sure they have eight hours. They have to have eight hours. Uh, let's, uh, let's jump into editing, uh, because we're running out of time. Uh, let's like, talk to me about what you've learned from editing. I know, I know sometimes we get married to scenes and that's not always the best thing to do. 
Well, I'll tell you one thing. Get, uh, uh, again, uh, I, I was uh, lucky enough to get, uh, read Ralph Rosenblum's book and read uh, my books because they talk about editing. But Rosenblum, is, he edited Annie Hall and he also edited Stuck on You. And again, Stuck on You was made in 1983. That's a long time ago. Uh, we, we weren't even uh, a crumb in those days. Yet he loved the script and he uh, saw the footage and he, he gave us a great deal. And he was terrific. Uh, George Norris, who edited Joe, uh, came on to Troma's War 20 years, uh, uh, yeah, about uh, well, 10 years later. Uh, so, so you get really good editors. Uh, Ed, uh, Gabe Friedman uh, uh, to, uh, learned the craft as he went along, but he's inherently talented and has a great sense of humor and gets Troma, which not uh, everybody gets. Uh, the other thing I think it's important, save some money. Because uh, certainly in my case, uh, I make mistakes. And if you have some money in post-production, you can get a, a skeleton crew and go back and fix things, as we did on Poultry Geist. Uh, uh, we got Debbie Rashan, and we needed a couple of cutaways to a crowd scene. And uh, we actually, uh, uh, I, by not, if I'm not uh, mistaken, we got some lovely, uh, I, I don't think we got any, we tried to get a penis, but we only got some melon-heavy breasts in that shot. I'm very, very nervous, but we're gonna do it. It's gonna be great. Kyle's gonna hit me in the head with the liquid. He's always wanted to do it, so no, he has a big no. chance. I, I really didn't didn't want to do this. I'm gonna be and very Jeremy, gentle. Jeremy told me to suck his cock. And roll it. Camera's rolling, action on the character. Suck his cock! Yeah. 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 What's the ideal running time? That's something that we always have a, a trouble with. Like, what is the ideal running time for, for a movie, in your opinion? I'm a, I, I, I've studied movies, and I've watched a lot of them and read biographies and autobiographies of directors. And uh, having watched a lot of movies, I say 84 minutes, and I think Michael Erz will agree with me. Uh, that is a good time, at least for the kinds of movies we make. I think it's a mistake for these people to be taking up two hours or, or more um, uh, you know, The Irishman, okay, but you watch it in uh, uh, sections and, uh, uh, you know, it's basically a series. But a movie like uh, Hashtag Shakespeare Shitstorm, I think we're 89 minutes and then the end credits go for uh, 48 minutes <laughs> because so many people were generous and we had so many people on the crew. Uh, that we uh, And we have all these Easter eggs and things or extra bonus material in the credits. <laughs> So you can turn the movie off after about 89 minutes. Um, let's move on for, uh, for time. We got 11 minutes. Let's talk about sound design and how exciting sound design is for you and why it's so important. Well, the sound design is something that fledgling filmmakers very often don't think about. And I think they're, I don't know if uh, film schools teach about uh, uh, the raising of money and sound design and, you know, they may talk about it, but you really have to do it. And a movie like Poultry Guys, Night of the Chicken Dead, or um, uh, uh, the uh, Return to Newcomb High movies, well, hashtag Shakespeare Shitstorm, uh, uh, again, just the movie comes to life with the sound design. It's so important. She'll make you pop a bona as she pops a wheelie! To skip through music and let's just go and talk about test screenings and why those are so important yeah that's great i don't know why people don't do it uh, get an audience because it's very hard to get the truth you know my wife gives me the truth um she is uh, she was very helpful when gabe and i and trent hager were writing citizen toxy um she, with patrick with uh, patrick cassidy, cassidy right uh, she would come out on, our, on my terrace and uh uh, oh, that uh, that scene sucked, or she'd say something very encouraging uh, like that. Uh, you need to get the truth from people. So the best way to get it is find people who might be sort of your demographic. In my case, it's young people, usually young people without a lot of uh, money. And uh, I have test screenings, focus groups, and we give them a questionnaire out of one to 10. What did you think of this movie? How do you like the, con the uh, you know, easy multiple choice questions. And then boxes where they can write their own uh, opinions if they so have them. And uh, we learn a lot from that. And uh, also just listening to the reactions of the 
where I think there's going to be a huge laugh, there might not be. I know? really wanted to get into how. I'm not going to pay for over that. Yeah. How you actually sell your movies, but we've run out of time. So if you want to learn, send Lloyd. No, no, just kidding. Hey. Uh, 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 but but I mean, there's definitely a conversation that we should have okay. about. We we finished our movie, and then how do we actually make some money? And I'm sure that everybody wants to know that. Uh, and that's probably a totally different conversation, but I think it's well. It's a good. It's, it's a very good one. And uh, you young uh, filmmakers out there, you have to make a, a crossroad decision. Are you going to take the road taken, or as Robert Frost uh, in his uh, poem, the road not taken? Uh, if you want to be an auteur filmmaker and uh, uh, you know uh, not walk the red carpet and have the mansions and the cars you don't own and the uh, stuff you can uh, the lines of the white stuff from uh, Dunkin' Donuts uh, to snort. You uh, you've got to go out to uh, the mainstream and to w go out west and where they uh, green light the movies and work your way up the food chain. Uh, James Gunn and have some talent. Obviously, you got ten seconds. What are you going to call us out with right now? Nine. Say it. Uh, what is <laughs> well for my own self? Be true. Get do what you want to do. But now people like James Gunn says, do what you're good at. I disagree. Do what you want to do. You only go around once. So I decided, uh, thanks to my good friend LSD, my last year at Yale, I uh, was alone, took acid, and uh, decided out of two options, one, to work on a Hollywood movie with uh, Barbara Streisand, or two, work for a shitty little company in New York uh, called Canon. I opted uh, for the shitty little company in New York and uh, lost an opportunity to work with the whiniest uh, actor in history. But I met John G. Avelson at the shitty little company. And my first uh, job on set of a movie was on his set, Joe. He asked for me to work there because he saw, he saw I loved movies and he loved, uh, and I loved uh, um, being on set and I was uh, smart and uh, knew how to kiss ass and be uh, smart, you know, be, uh, not kiss ass, but uh, get along with everybody. But the point is, uh, be prepared to you know work for free. Just get on a set. Eli Roth will tell you that. Yeah, I'll ask do me. what you believe in. Do they don't self be true? A uh, phrase coined by one uh, William Shakespeare, who wrote that uh, famous maxim, uh, "To thine own self be true," uh, uh, which is uh, another title for the best-selling book, uh, uh, 101 money-making screenplay ideas. Otherwise known as he also wrote a little movie called Shakespeare Shitstorm. Yes, available he somewhere he helped. somewhere. He helped with that one. Yeah.